As European empires crumbled in the mid 20th century, the power structures that had dominated our world for centuries should have been up for renegotiation. It was a really important time when things could have been different, things should have been different. Yet instead what happened, um, instead of a triumph for democracy, what emerged was what we call a, uh, in this book a, a silent coup, namely the unstoppable rise of global corporate power. And the result is, of this is the world that we live in today, where corporate empires increasingly dictate how resources are allocated, how territories are governed, how justice is defined, and who is safe around the world. So this is the thesis of this uh, new book, um, Silent Coup, How Corporations Overthrew Democracy with my co-author Matt Kennard. It was published last month um, in English uh, by Bloomsbury in the UK. Um, but it is the result of work that we began in 2014, so about a decade ago, when we were fellows at the Center for Investigative Journalism in London. Um, and so in, this, in, in our work and in this book, we go deep into multinational corporate systems and strategies, um, uh, as well as historical archives to trace the origins of this epic power grab. But this book begins, and our work began, uh, really on the front lines of contemporary st local struggles against this power grab. Um, between us, we went to 25 countries over the years that we worked on this book um, and this project. And around the world, um, we found activists locally whose struggles had made them experts in these issues and their consequences for democracy and our chance responding to climate change and building more just and sustainable futures. But this expertise that was held in these, the, the perspectives and the stories and the knowledge held by these activist movements were not reaching um, international audiences, were not reaching um, news agenda, were not shaping uh, headlines. And um, as journalists, uh, I, I had worked at The Guardian before in London. And my co-author um, was at The Financial Times before. And so this project also set off a like a long um, period of like critical uh, exploration for us about what our own industry is doing, um, and 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 what what needs to change in the media itself, in order for people's movements to have a shot at challenging corporate power. Um, so our first major investigation was prompted by an unexpected phone call that we received in 2014 from a Canadian water just, I'm originally from Canada, from a Canadian water justice activist who I had met years before. Um, and she encouraged us to go to El Salvador and then, uh, which we did, and then we went deep into an obscure but powerful international legal system that enables multinational corporations to sue whole countries, whole populations for millions, even billions of dollars over a wide range of actions, including environmental regulations that they don't like. So at that time, in 2014, when we go to El Salvador, the country was facing a $300 million legal case from a then Canadian, um, Cana initially Canadian and then Canadian and Australian multinational mining company. And this company really wanted access to El Salvador's gold, but it, it, it hadn't received the necessary permits, environmental permits. Um, for example, it also had not secured access to most of the land that it needed in order to open um, its desired gold mine. And that was because local farmers refused to sell their land, refused to give their land over to the project. Um, and, and so you would think that in that case, you don't have the permits, you don't even have the land, you, you clearly can't open your mine. But um, the company, because it was a foreign company, um, and it, it went to a little known branch of the World Bank in Washington, DC called the International Center for the Settlement of Investment Disputes that hears cases lodged by companies and foreign investors directly against states. And so this, this institution, ICSID, um, at, in 2014, I had never heard of it. Um, my colleague, had, Matt, hadn't either. And we were both journalists at mainstream publications um, covering global economics, and we hadn't heard of it. Um, uh, it was not well known in London where we lived. It was not well known in Washington where it's based. Um, it's not even well known within the World Bank itself. When we went to the World Bank um, headquarters in Washington, DC, it was really hard to find the office of ICSID because everyone you meet in the corridors, they hadn't, they hadn't heard of it, didn't know what it was. Um, so it was that obscure at that time in 2014. 
Um, and yet everyone we met in El Salvador, from the taxi driver that we, from the taxi on the way from the airport, to activists, to shop workers, to the people at the guest house, to priests, they had all heard of it by its Spanish acronym CIADI. Um, and when we traveled there in 2014, and it was that September, and it was to attend a festival of, festival of resistance organized by environmental and community activists against that legal case that, was, that they said was threatening the country's sovereignty and its ability to choose its own development path. And that was because at the time, there was a really remarkable and increasingly widespread and influential social movement amidst an extreme clean water crisis for El Salvador to become the world's first country to ban mining nationwide. And that this, is a, that this is a phenomenal demand, right? To make your territory entirely mining free. I come from a mining town in northern Canada. This is a phenomenal, like, phenomenal thing to demand. It's a phenomenal thing to push forward. It's a phenomenal thing that to actually succeed in doing. El Salvador does, several years after we go, does succeed in becoming the world's first country to ban mining nationwide. Um, but that success was delayed by, for many years by that international legal case, by fear of threats, uh, fear of potential other suits from other companies, defending yourself against one, $300 million for El Salvador was like the equivalent to the entire bilateral aid it received every year. It was a huge amount of money. Defending your, yourself against one case like that is one thing, but five or 10 is a very different thing. And so there was a lot of fear that other companies were also gonna file suits. Um, so this case con, you know, really consumed a lot of energy that could have and should have been going to the popularly demanded movement to ban mining. Um, meanwhile, at the same time, the anti-mining activists were also facing like local threats, attacks, and killings, and um, several killings. So this, this case in El Salvador, this powerful social movement up against this bizarre international legal system that we hadn't heard of before, this was our introduction to what's called the International Investor State Dispute Settlement System, or often I use the acronym ISDS. Um, and the World Bank's ICSID branch that has overseen the bulk of these cases since the system was set up in the mid-20th century. And so I checked yesterday just to have the most up-to-date figures, and um, multinational corporations and foreign investors, as of yesterday, have filed almost 1,000 cases at this World Bank branch. Many of these have never been reported on, have never been, you know, um, taxpayers who will pay the bills if, they, if countries lose, uh, citizens and residents who live under laws that can be challenged by the system often never hear about these cases. Um, more than almost 300 of these cases are currently still pending. Um, many, most of them have been um, filed alleging bio, violations of investor rights under international investment and trade treaties that have been signed either by pairs of states or by groups of states. They include many treaties signed by the Netherlands that enable businesses here, even the so-called letterbox companies, um, to file such suits. And once signed, it's really, uh, the, once signed, these treaties can be canceled, but it's often quite hard and difficult and expense, uh, expensive to do that. They often have what's called sunset clauses or sometimes zombie clauses. Um, that mean that their provisions stay in force for many years after and potentially like 20, 30 years after. So even if you decide to cancel and try to get out of the system as a country, um, uh, it's sort of set up to make that impossible. If you think about what happens with like government, like elections and on our political systems, 20 years could be five governments. So corporate power has five shots to get that cancellation withdrawn, right? So it's a, it's a very dangerous system. Um, in many of these cases, there are no public documents available. Um, so there's generally little media coverage of these cases. And there's the, some of that is to do with problems, I think, within, within the media industry. But it's also not a transparent system. It's not accessible. It's not accountable. Um, and the Salvadoran activists we met, um, including at this Festival of Resistance, were really clear about what was at stake. Um, uh, and it wasn't only the $300 million. And this was an important learning for us as journalists who are used to like following the money, that in this case, they said that the $300 million was almost like a red herring. 
that what the company wanted was not the money. They wanted to overturn national laws and get access to the gold. They wanted to defeat the anti-mining movement and dig no matter what. Um, so what was at stake, they said, was not, was, what was at stake was not just their bu the national budget, but what was really at stake was their shot at democracy and their shot at dealing with extreme environmental threats. Um, they also explained from this firsthand experience what we would later learn as described by academics as regulatory chill, um, how even the threat of such a case can affect a government policy, um, can delay action on certain things. So El Salvador delaying the mining ban to make sure it's not going to get slammed with many more suits. Um, and they also described what law firms involved in the system like often tell their clients that you can use a case to gain leverage in negotiation with states, that you can file a case not looking for the money. You can file a case demanding a huge amount of money as, as, a, as a stick to threaten a state with. So around the world, local social, environmental, and other justice movements have similarly become experts in otherwise obscure international mechanisms and systems that multinational corporations and foreign investors use to enforce their will and overrule democracies. And their knowledge and, and stories that are central to our book um, should be much more widely known than they are. Than they are. So I, I have some other examples I wanted to share, which are, um, so the, our, the first section of the, of the book looks at this international legal system, which we call corporate justice system. Um, and <clears throat> examples of other things that we learned from social movements about how this system works um, include from South Africa. South Africa was um, sued by a group of Italian investors over black economic empowerment um, policies that were supposed to help the country to move on after apartheid and to help re redress historical injustices. Um, these were policies that were nationally discussed, um, in theory democratically debated, um, and uh, uh, were huge public interest around the world. There was a huge anti-apartheid movement around the world. The idea that post-apartheid black economic empowerment policies were being challenged at this court in this obscure, unaccountable court in Washington, DC, this should have been a, a, a global scandal. There was almost no media coverage of it at the time, however. Um, and what happened in that case was um, that uh, the, the investors gained an exemption to the, law, to the policies that they didn't like. The government settled. The government settled. They didn't want to take the risk of losing the case and having the policies completely overturned. And so they settled and gave this group of investors an exemption. And the South African anti-apartheid activists that we met, they, they knew that the case was happening. And they tried to get access, while the case was happening, they tried to get access to the deliberations. They, they filed requests at the World Bank. The World Bank, which officially has a global poverty reducing mandate, um, asking for permission to attend the hearings, to hear what was going to happen, and to share perspectives from the anti-poverty movements in South Africa. The World Bank rejects these, rejects these requests. Um, uh, so the civil society organizations are not allowed in. They are, however, allowed to submit a written brief with their concerns, which they do, and they outline all of the concerns you can probably imagine, right? You, you, you know, an, interna uh, an obscure international legal system shouldn't be able to o overturn black economic empowerment policies that we need as a country to address our history and to move on and not be trapped in the worst expression of ourselves. They explain all of that, and then the and and none of that is relevant to the tribunal. And so this was very revealing. None of this is none of that was none of those comments concerns were relevant to a tribunal looking at black economic empowerment policies, basically, because at the end of the day, the only thing they care about is whether the foreign investors' rights have been violated. And a major right that you have as, an, as a foreign investor when, under the system when you go into a country is that your expectations are met. And so if you go into a country um, with an apartheid regime, um, you have a legitimate expectation under the system to be able to continuously forever profit from that. Um, uh, chain, and similarly, you know, it, we've seen similar cases, for example, in Germany, where um, uh, in, the, in the midst of movements to move away from coal, uh, 
because of climate change and climate change concerns. Um, the, uh, the local government in Hamburg um, tries to impose very strict uh, reg uh, requirements on a new coal-fired power plant. And it, it follows European regulations as strictly as possible to, make, to give, them a, give them a water permit, but give them a very tight water permit in, in line with EU regulations. Um, that water permit then becomes the subject of another case. Uh, the company objects to that water permit. It started looking at its investments before people started caring about climate change. The climate change concerns violate its legitimate expectations as an investor. And so it files a case. Um, that case ends similarly to the South African one in that they get an exemption to those regulations. They're able to increase the um, amount of heat that they add to the water and the, their local environmental impact. And we, but we only know that because because it was a, a it was a closed door settlement, and we only know um, uh, how how that how that how it resol resol was resolved because German environmental activists and environmental lawyers um, undertook a really detailed study of the water permits before the case was filed and the water permit after the case was filed and when the case was dropped, um, and and they're able to trace the weakening of environmental regulations as a result of the case. Um, there are other, se other sections of our book look at um, other international systems and strategies multinational corporations have used, all dating from the same period of time, from the mid-20th century when decolonization movements were, were growing, independence, freedom, people's freedom movements were growing, labor movements in, in wealthier countries were growing. Um, uh, so they all date from the same time, but they're four different systems and strategies that we look at. The other ones are, um, other sections of the book are called corporate welfare, looking at how aid and development systems have been used by corporations to expand and overrule democratic debates, including about what kind of development paths you're allowed to pursue. Um, corporate utopias, looking at the expansion of carve-outs of physical territories, including into special economic zones, tax havens, private cities. Um, uh, and then the last section of the book is called Corporate Armies, which is about the corporate control over the use of force and security. And throughout these sections, um, uh, local activists and social movement members are major characters in the book, helping to expose these systems and strategies and how they've enabled the corporate capture of political power as well as economic power, not just about money, but also about control and decision making. Um, I'm just going to jump. Um, but we also, we also spent a lot of time in the process of working on this book um, with uh, industry insiders, so like lawyers, financiers, consultants that work with corporations. Um, we also went into historical archives to try to piece together the story of how these systems come to be. And so at that World Bank branch where we found the ICSID center, the center that oversees these cases, which was hard to find because nobody even in the bank knew where it was, um, uh, we, we managed to obtain copies of historical documents from the time uh, of the establishment of this, of, of this center at the World Bank in the 1960s. Um, and uh, the story that those documents told is quite different from that of a system that was set up with good intentions, but that has been captured by corporate power or corrupted <coughs> by corporate power. Rather, the, the story the documents t tell is that the, this was the purpose from the beginning. Um, and so when we see cases challenging social justice issues and environmental issues, um, that's not a corruption of the system. It's the system working as intended to isolate private interests from democracy. The summary, summary notes from World Bank regional meetings at the time showed that some developing countries had fiercely objected to the idea of the system's creation like from the beginning. Um, they objected to the substance, the, the, the substance of the idea and the form of the idea. Um, they argued that the substance of the idea would give foreign investors a privileged position in violation of the principle of equality. Um, this is, that's a, a Brazilian delegate. An Indian delegate at another World Bank meeting said it would, warned that it would give investors additional rights of unspecified scope and that the draft proposals should be also considered in a wider forum beyond, before being adopted rather than these sort of closed door meetings. Um, a Thai delegate also st stressed that any comments he made in those consultations should not be seen as 
you know, of the official position of the Thai government in any way, and that anything that would affect Thai laws would have to go through a Thai democratic and le a legal process. Um, but this ICSID center was set up despite any of the, despite all of those concerns. Rather, what happened was the bank saw, heard these concerns, and the World Bank heard these concerns, and then undertook a really extensive strategy um, to push through its proposals despite them, and to prevent um, opposition from uniting. And so they adopted tactics, for example, like not sharing notes from the Latin American consultation with the Asians, not letting the Filipinos talk to the Indians, that kind of thing. Um, noticing what were the problematic states, trying to keep them apart. Um, <clears throat> and, um, uh, but before, before the bank takes this up, um, this idea up and sets up this, this, this institution despite the opposition, um, there was actually significant consultation about it, just not with any kind of democratic representatives or people's movements. So digging deeper into the history of what, ha what happened before the 60s, before the World Bank sets this up, um, we found another really extraordinary window into the creation of the system in the archives of Time magazine, um, because in the late 1950s, the American magnate who owned Time Life, that, 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 that company, started funding what was called the International Industrial Development Conference, or I IDC, another acronym. Um, and the 1957 edition of this event was held in San Francisco, where um, Herman Abs, who was the head of the Deutsche Bank at the time, made a very well-received pitch for such a system, many, many years before the World Bank's ICSID Center was set up. Um, and so because Time Life and, and its magnate was involved in this conference, the magazine published an illustrated eight-page supplement to it entitled The Capitalist Challenge. Um, its articles were written really colorfully with descriptions of who was consulted on the system, including an international who's who of high finance and high office. Um, they say, from London came financiers whose, bank, whose firms had bankrolled the Industrial Revolution. From Berlin came the brisk businessmen who have built Europe's sturdiest economy. The managing director of the Italian car giant Fiat was among the, the bosses there. Um, but then by far the biggest delegation was a 220 uh, person group of US executives, including from major now multinational companies. Um, so the articles in the supplement then describe the kind of conversations that are had at this meeting. Um, uh, concerns over protecting investment, investments in new land, seething with nationalism. Um, descriptions of how one of the biggest barriers in the way of foreign investment um, in underdeveloped countries is lies in the minds and emotions of those who need foreign investment most, but equate it with 19th century style colonialism and therefore are reluctant to accept it. Abs, the German banker, then gave what Time called the most widely apl applauded concrete proposal of the conference. He responded to these concerns in the room by he similarly denounced the well-known attitude of some less developed countries according to which the Western world is actually obliged to pay for their, the advancement of their economies. He dismisses possible calls for reparations post-colonialism. And instead, he presents a, an epic plan to fight back against unruly governments, uh, including preem preemptively, with what was actually called a new capitalist Magna Carta. So I've got to bury the lead by putting it there. It's a extraordinarily ambitious plan um, to create a new, entirely new legal system backed by a new international court that would establish effective and enforceable rule of law for private foreign investment. And in this meeting, 500 um, of, of some representatives, some of the wealthy, biggest companies in the world at the time, um, you know, the crowd goes wild for this idea according to time. The context was the Cold War, was the rising independence movements in the South and the labor movements in the North. Foreign, for, like big multinational companies were feeling the feet, the, the earth shift beneath their feet um, across former, or then still colonial, some still colonial countries. There were industries that could be nationalized. There were land holdings that could be taken over. 
Um, the German banker Ab says that his proposed system will help respond to or prevent all of that. Um, but he says it can also deal with what he called indirect interferences with the rights of private foreign capital, including it can deal with states re who refuse to give up essential raw materials, like El Salvador, or companies that, um, uh, uh, or states that refuse to grant licenses, or states that engage in what he called excessive taxation. So even from the beginning, the, there were way, the, the, the promoters of this idea were thinking about how it could um, provide a, a really sweeping service for private capital to protect it, protect it, enable it to expand unfettered. Um, that San Francisco event was just one stop on this German banker's international campaign trail promoting this global legal system. Um, and so a couple months after San Francisco, he publishes a draft uh, uh, international convention for the, for the protection of private property. Um, and then a couple of years later, he merges that with a draft from another man in the UK, creating an, uh, what's called the Abs Shawcross draft. It doesn't go very far, though, for a little while. It struggles to get pick up at the UN OECD um, until the World Bank uh, takes it on. Um, the World Bank at the time that was incre getting increasingly involved in expanding private business interests globally, and the World Bank at the time, which was not interested in democratic and accountable consultations and meetings. So I'm going to end very shortly, but long before, so long before what we often talk about is like the Washington Consensus, and long before creations of institutions like the World Bank, and even, bef even before, so a lot of this starts, starts before the Second World War, elites gathering to lay really ambitious international plans to protect and expand their private empires from threats posed by progressive and people's movements around the world. So this is all, is all a backlash as well, and a response to what, what I said at the beginning was a time where things could have and should have been different, and private capital was aware that they could be different too. And so there was a lot of work done over many, many decades to create ways to insulate corporations and their power from these changes. Um, all of the systems that we look at in the book were, were created at that time of uh, what's often called decolonization, um, but they've now gone global. They were created at that time to focus on developing on poor countries in the South. Um, they were created in the context of the Cold War, but you know, now we're you know, 70, 80 years later, Cold War is over. Um, uh, you know, we're lo generations past the moment of, of decolonization. These systems have not disappeared. Instead, they've gone completely global. Um, so now, we ha Netherlands also gets sued. Germany gets sued, by, for example, in this legal system. Initially, it was only countries in the south. Um, similarly, you have special economic zones and free ports opening up all over the world now. Um, and, and, and it could have been different, though, and it still can be different. And what was, what was concerning to the World Bank when it was setting up that legal system, um, but also what we've seen concern capital in, in other cases after is transnational solidarity. So this is why the World Bank works really hard to prevent countries from talking to each other. Um, uh, and, and, and so it could be different, it still can be different. But it's a, it's a long-term plan. Like I mean, it would require long-term plans to recapture political power from this silent coup, much like the silent coup itself was a product of very long-term plans. Done. I'm done. Oh, nice. I'm done. <laughs> yeah.